Colin Hartman taking complete responsibility for it as he uh, joins us now. <laughs> How's it going, Mr. Sunshine? Oh, it's been crazy. It's all good, but uh, it has been it's been a ride in this transfer portal and NIL and all that. It's just <laughs> it's interesting. Very yeah, interesting. you know, I, I was talking during the season. It's extraordinarily busy, and it just builds, and then you get to the end. The the tournaments are, become crazy because the work is doubled, and then you add the traveling on top of it. And, and then as soon as the tournament is over, it used to be ah, you could take a breath. Well, now there is no breath. You just stay. You stay on that damn hamster wheel because the portal <laughs> kicks in for the next three or four weeks, and it is. You don't have to do the traveling, but other than that, you're you're tethered to getting, gathering, posting, listening uh, information, mm -hmm. and um, that's on our side. Same, but for you guys that work, uh, uh, whether it's what part of the that uh, of the process that you're in, whether it's the recruiting, the NIL side, it, that is just such a freaking hyper busy time it's probably the busiest window of the year and it's crazy you know they um a lot of coaches want to get this buttoned up soon you know the transfer portal they don't like dealing with it they don't like doing the the whole nil conversation this that and the other thing in, in the transfer portal now and it's and i understand why i mean it's a nightmare right we don't talk to anybody until they're you know at they're they're at IU, enrolled in classes, enrolled as a student. Um, but, I mean, we have to keep tabs on it as well to kind of – we have our own understanding of what ballpark numbers would look like for a given player in terms of, quote-unquote, market value, <laughs> if there's such a thing, um, and, and what value they could provide to us and our corporate sponsors. So, um, you know, we have to start thinking about that and keeping tabs on it because, you know, at the end of the day, we're – we have to budget and kind of make all those numbers work to try to allocate it as um, efficiently as possible, honestly. So it's it's been crazy. We took a trip to D.C., met with some members of Congress a couple of weeks ago. That was interesting as well. They had a preliminary NIL hearing um, on the Wednesday, and we were out there Tuesday meeting with a couple of members of Congress, kind of educating them on, you know, what we do, how we do it how it's done incorrectly across, across the country, um, address some of the hot button uh, topics, right? The, the, uh, the sound bites that people put out there, you know, pay for play and, you know, recruiting and how it plays a role in that. And it really just kind of, it really highlighted to me kind of like <laughs> maybe like most issues across the country that <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about at the federal level. So um, right. you got a lot of people that aren't in the space uh, trying to regulate it and wrap their arms that's around the, it. See, that's the scariest part is when you, and I was getting ready to say, every time the government gets involved in something like this, that is, you have to have, you have to have knowledge. You have to know. You have to understand it. You have to understand the impact. You have to understand the sports, understand the athletes, the schools. There's so many, many different variables that go into it, and there is no way in hell, A, that they can get up to speed that quick. B, I don't think that they care about getting up to speed that quick because C, a lot of the times it's more about their own agendas of being having their name on the bill or whatever the case may be. Uh, and that's the scary thing because then you get legislation, but it goes in, kind of in the wrong direction. My opinion is, <clears throat> and this could totally be wrong. So, <laughs> but mine. What's your opinion? opinion? It can't be wrong. <laughs> that's true yeah i don't it could be ridiculous any... but not wrong <laughs> that's true it's not ridiculous it's it's, it's <laughs> I, i'm kidding i'm totally kidding uh, i'm totally well, kidding. Hey, my wife may agree with you on most of my opinions are ridiculous <laughs> yeah. um, but um from a federal level um if they're going to put any you know impactful meaningful legislation into place um it's not going to happen this year they just – they don't even come close to having their arms wrapped around it um, to actually put meaningful legislation. Now, they can rush it and put crappy legislation in place that really doesn't solve anything um, or hurts NIL and the environment for student-athletes, right? Um, 
But I think, you know, I don't think they can touch it this year because they don't know enough. I don't think they'll touch it next year because it's not going to win the, win them an election. It's not a right or left issue. I think NIL is interesting at the federal level because it's not, it's not political, right? It's not um, Republican or Democrat. You can have people that have viewpoints on both sides. So I think some people like talking about it because it's one of the few issues at the federal level that's not us versus them kind of thing. Um, Bipartisan, what you're looking for. Yeah, that. Um, <laughs> and I, I think I think it would be 2025 before they really have any meaningful legislation come into play. Now, like I said, they can rush it and put, you know, somebody can slap their name on a bill um, and, you know, do whatever they want for their constituents or whatever company is funding them that's also funding an IL and has a vested interest, right? Um, but I don't think it'll happen anytime soon. When, when so we talk about legislation and giving it out, two, two or a year and a half out from like this coming football season, I'd say. When, when you Probably. talk about legislation and, and regulating and uh, the government getting involved, like are there certain aspects that you'd like to see about NIL get changed or certain things get cemented? And that's that's probably me being, you know, maybe not knowing enough about it. But what, what areas need to be addressed um, so that way everybody's on the same page, in your opinion? Well, I think there needs to be two things, in my opinion. Um, I think there needs to be somewhat uniform – contract language in terms of certain aspects of the contract that, you know, protect the student athletes. Um, and also, and it's hard to do this because different athletes have different market value and there's different athlete, different people are willing to pay more in the free market. Right. Like it, right. you can't limit what people want to pay and drew with their money. Um, I don't think that there should be limits on how much an athlete can make. That's stupid. Um, but I think there should be transparency, um, in the agreements, right? What there should be. And I think the NCAA is looking at this, putting some sort of like database together where everybody submits their contracts or the agreements, um, as well as transparency with compensation, right? How much are the athletes actually making from each contract from each, you know, whether it's an independent business, whether it's a collective or, you know, whatever that may be, um, what are they making? What are they doing to receive that dollar amount? I think, you know, that's, it only helps the athlete prove that they're doing meaningful work, right? Because what I told Congress was like, and we were telling them while we were out there is you don't want to, you want to protect this student athlete, not limit their opportunities. Sure. Right. So um, I think with, with transparency within the agreements on a deliverables in relativity to the compensation for those deliverables. I think that's, that would be good. Um, and I think some sort of uniform language, um, like in the indemnification scenarios and rights to content in the contracts and those certain sections like that in the contracts and the agreements that we facilitate, I think that would be good to have across the country. Um, because then we go back and forth with agencies and, you know, some athletes that don't have agencies um, or representation may be getting, you know, short into the stick on some of those deals across the country. Um, we keep it pretty uniform across all athletes that we do deals with. Um, so I think those are the two hot button points to regulate. I don't think it's, <laughs> I, I just, the one of the main thing is at the federal level, the question is who regulates it, right? Right. Do, right. Do, do does the feds kick it back to the NCAA to enforce it, which I don't think the NCAA has the bandwidth to truly enforce NIL across the country. Um, so that would have to be a a mass, um, not overhaul, but redesign of how they do that. Right. And and so, and to that point, so this is this leads into my next question a little bit because. I go back to Quinn Ewers, who was a five-star. I think he was the top-rated quarterback out of Texas. He couldn't get NIL for his senior season at Texas, um, playing high school football in the state of Texas. So he trans or he he enrolled at Ohio State a year early, so he could cash in on some NIL money. I mean, is, is that a problem that you would run into? Where um, not because to me, if if government gets involved, NIL just isn't a college issue. Then it becomes a, a high school 
situation and certain states mm -hmm. may, may not allow they might have their own rules on that like are, are you running into difficulty with that with recruits guys at the high school level who are maybe already inking some nil deals um and can't whether state regulations or otherwise can't cash in whereas if you're in another state maybe some of those recruits are able to get that money so i would say we're not necessarily feeling that um i think it's um more of a top five percent of football schools that are dabbling in that world um we don't <laughs> we don't touch it um we've found that there's less of an nil issue at the high school level just because there's less demand for it right like the top right. top one sure. percent of high school students are going to be having any opportunities for nil yeah. um i think the federal legislation should create the foundation of like it's the feds um they need to make a decision on if high school students can make this money or not, right? Because if you look at it from the collegiate standpoint, NIL allows student athletes to stay in school longer if they want to, right? right? They don't have to take that risk to jump pro. Now, what you don't want to do is make kids leave high school early, right? Right. Um, or feel like they have to, because it's the same scenario. A lot of these kids come from nothing, absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these kids that we do agreements with, they send their money home, right? That, the, the the kids that are making hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars are buying cars and doing all that. There's a, that's the minority of NIL, right? The majority is people are helping their car parents get out of out of debt. They're sending money home to pay the bills. They're you know paying their parents cancer bills, uh, medical bills, all stuff stuff like that, right? Um, you know they're starting scholarship funds like Taiwan Mullen did. So there's a lot of good stories and and right. quite frankly, I think of the majority of NIL deals. Um, Anthony Leal is another great one. Get, yep. And so you don't want to get into a scenario at the high school level with federal legislation that makes kids not be able to, right, make money. Um, I think they should adhere to the same transparency in terms of the agreements and language and all that. Um, sure. But I don't think you want to limit their want or desire or ability to stay in high school just because, you know, somebody's dangling some you know fat check in front of them right, right. and that's the same thing in, at the college levels like you know student athletes are able to stay if they're on the 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 edge of you know going to the nba or going to the nfl they and you know they're they can have another year to improve their draft stock or whatever that may look like or give another run or finish their degree or you know just be a college kid for one more year um you know that nil kind of allows for a buffer to for kids to do that so um, I don't. I think that the feds would want to protect the student athletes, not limit, limit opportunities. That's my opinion. With the transparency, I and I agree with, but there will also come. Uh, it, it's going to bring both good and bad. Uh, then you have to weigh private versus public. Uh, what do private schools have to do versus public? But first mm -hmm. of all, why would student athletes have to disclose? what they're making from certain things when the rest of us don't have to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then is that going to lead to problems as far as elevating the cost of this? Say, well, that dude got that there. Uh, just like everybody in the NFL, every, every quarterback is looking at, at, uh, um, Oh, the Sean Watson, Jack, the jackass in Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, because Cleveland gave him stupid, ridiculous, un, no way to get a return on their investment, and it has l it screw it screwed the league. It screwed up mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lamar Jackson trying to get his deal, and that's one of the things I'm worried about happens once the numbers get out because there are going to be the John Ruizes of the world, and next time it may not be eight hundred thousand; it may be one point eight million. That's true. And, you know, I think there's there's kind of two sides of that, that sword, right? It's don't infringe on somebody's private right to, you know, disclose their income. Um, but I think, you know, there's also a, a side of that same as, you know, all these fans are contributing dollars to these collectives. And it's, they're the ones paying the student athlete and have no idea how much a student athlete's making, right? Could you imagine being an employer for lack of a better term, right? Um, and not knowing how much your employee is actually making type of thing. And that's a wild stretch of a, you know, example. 
but I think, you know, I think it, I don't think student athletes are making as much as everybody says they are across the they're country. Get, no, no, they're, they're not. They're, people are thinking that guys are I, making a lot more than they really are. I, well, I think, yeah. I, to, I, yeah. I, I was going to say, I think, I think that you hear the stories about the, the top, as Colin mentioned, the top 1%, maybe the top 5% of that once in a lifetime quarterback or a really good running back. And then they just assume that that's what everybody's getting or they, you know, because we're not writing, we're, we're not writing stories or, or talking about the offensive lineman who got $5,000 to go, uh, you know, to, to sign autographs at a restaurant. I'm just throwing something out there. You know, you don't, we're not right. writing stories about those articles. We're writing stories about the kid who gets $800,000 or sign this massive NIL deal. So I completely agree with that. And on that front, Colin, I'm interested. You mentioned this a couple of times in terms of market value. I mean, how do you keep tabs on that? How do you evaluate that for each player? Is, is there a way to go about that? Or um, is that just kind of up in the air? So my opinion is, and I go back and forth with, with our attorneys on this <laughs> a little bit. I think there's no such thing as market value. Okay. Right. Um, because there's several factors that, that we take into account when, um, when deciding what to pay an athlete, right? There's, um, you know, social media reach. Let me back sure. up. There's two, there's two markets in terms of market value. There's national and there's local, right? There are very few athletes that are going to have national marketability. Mm -hmm. um, that's like the top 1% of student athletes, right? Um, most student athletes are going to have local market value where, you know, if you're an IU basketball player, if you're Trey Jackson Davis, everybody in the state knows your face, most likely, yeah. right? Um, he may not have very high level national market value, and he 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 does now, right? Uh, yeah, but right. you take Trey, you take Trey Galloway, for example, not nationally marketable, but very marketable locally, right? And so it's like to a national company, they're like that guy's not worth twenty grand to us, but to a local company, it's like wow, that, that guy's worth a hundred to us, right? Um, so we take into account, you know, social media presence. You know, Miller Cop has a great social media presence um, and has built a great brand. And then you also take into account the um, – and the NCAA says you can do this, is you can take into account performance, right? Because that directly impacts their likability, recognizability, um, you know, all of that. So you take into account those couple things, um, you know, and their personality plays plays a role. Are they great with your core? Are they going to be great with your corporate sponsors? Are they going to be great with your members? Right, because then you can sell that, and it's good content, and people are interested, and they want to get to know the kid, and the kids out there, you know, wanting to get to know the fans and interacting with them, and this, that, and other thing. So um, there's several different factors that we take into account when talking about, you know, what's quote unquote market value. I just don't think there's such thing. There's kind of ways that you can get to what it looks like, but I don't think that. There's one cut and dry. If you ask some website, what's their market value? That website doesn't know. Um, so I think it's, uh, that's kind of my long-winded answer of market value. I don't think it exists. <laughs> I don't think that you can pinpoint it for anyone else. <laughs> well, we're going to take a quick break, know. but here's a, here's a comment here that says, I saw Bron where Bronny James has a $10 million NIL deal. Well, first of all, is that fact? And if it is, that would be off the chart. A, B would be because of LeBron James, and C, that's about what – that's close to what a lottery pick would make over three freaking years in the NBA. Uh, well, that, so that, that deal is probably that accurate. It, it but that's, probably that accurate. is so out of the – if his but last name was not James, that wouldn't be happening. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't be close. But he has a great social media following on a national scale. And then outside of that, you know, He, like you said, you wouldn't have that if it wasn't for LeBron James. And I'm very curious of the contract and the inner workings of that contract. If Because some of these contracts across the country that you see that have huge numbers aren't cash for cash. Like, it's not a cash deal, right? There's, like, options for future performances on out external stocks or external, you know, cryptos or whatever that looks like, right? NFTs, all that stuff. Some of that, some portions of that contract are based on and even in the NFL, like a lot of the – in the NBA, a lot of those – you see the fat contracts. 
but they're not getting that just cash handed to them. A lot of it's based on performance in the league and, you know, are they hitting certain time, uh, certain amount of games played, certain amount of minutes played, certain amount of assists, da 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 to get that full value of that agreement. I think some of that's happening um, in college athletics and NIL world, and that's where I think the transparency really comes into play at a high level.